Uh, my name is Mark Bellamy. I'm the director of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. I especially want to welcome uh, our friends and so many of our friends and collaborators and say a special word of welcome to an old friend, General William Ward. Kip Ward was the first commander of Africa. It's with us. Very good to see you, General. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, we're here to um, um, to launch a, a new special report, a special report uh, produced by um, a, a working group set up by the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, a report entitled Africa and the Arab Spring, uh, a new era of democratic expectations. And before introducing the, uh, the three panelists who will talk a little bit about this report and invite your questions, I wanted to give you a little bit of context uh, behind the creation of this special report. Um, I think as we, as we all know, uh, or certainly at least as we all intuit, 2011, this past year, uh, has been a, a year of historic change, of, of momentous change. The revolts uh, in North Africa that we have come to call the Arab Spring or the Arab Awakening uh, have profoundly changed the governance landscape in North Africa, but have had important reverberations and major impacts beyond that region, as we continue to see in places such as Syria and, and Yemen. And in sub-Saharan Africa as well, these events in North Africa have been closely watched and have registered, uh, and have registered in, in a number of different ways, and that is the subject matter of this special report. As this report notes, Sub-Saharan Africa's democratization experience actually predates the Arab Spring, predates by at least a generation. Many of the demands of the protesters in North Africa are rights that Africans already have, at least on paper, the jury, at least in theory. And yet the democratization process that began in earnest in much of Sub-Saharan Africa in the 1990s has slowed down in some places. It's taken a wrong turn or wrong turns in some other places. Corruption and inequality have undermined public confidence in the democratization process in some countries. And some analysts and some politicians in Sub-Saharan Africa have even talked of a, of a democracy deficit or of, of democracy backsliding, particularly when they connect or when the public connects elections with violence and instability. So it is against this backdrop of advances in some areas and of uneven and halting progress in other areas that this study was undertaken. We wanted to assemble a working group that would assess the broader relevance of the revolts in North Africa and their implications for further political change, democratic change, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Put in another way, uh, our goal has been to provide an analytical framework to what is still an unfolding process so that policymakers can better discern the larger pattern of events at play and also to put forward a series of policy recommendations that we believe are needed to sustain those democratic advances that are underway and to encourage further potential moves towards democratization in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, I hope all of you have had a chance, or will have the chance, to, uh, to read this report and to draw upon some of its insights and conclusions. And of course, we will welcome your comments and observations today uh, and in the future. Our panel today uh, consists of several members of the working group uh, that uh, that put the paper uh, that put the report together, and they're going to highlight some of the, the key findings. Uh, specifically, Joe Siegel, uh, Dr. Joe Siegel to my left, who is the director of research at the Africa Center, and he was the working group chair. And Joe is going to summarize some of the uh, overarching themes that have emerged uh, from this project. Uh, to Joe's left is Chris Famunya, who is the National Democratic Institute's 
uh, Regional Director for Africa. And Chris will discuss some of the specific findings and observations in the report. And um, next, to, uh, next to Chris is Dr. Edward Ned uh, McMahon, who is professor at the University of Vermont and senior research associate at Freedom House. And he will review some of the report's key recommendations. And after their presentations, uh, we will open it up to your comments and questions. Uh, before turning uh, the microphone over to Joe Siegel, I, I did want to recognize uh, some of the other members uh, of this working group who I think are with us today. I saw Joel Barkin here uh, at the uh, at the end of the front row here. Welcome, Joel. I don't know if Dave Peterson from NED is with us, but uh, Dave was a uh, valuable contributor. Dr. Matt Nipo uh, from the Africa Center was a member of the working group, and Davin O'Regan next to Matt, uh, a research uh, our senior research associate at ACSS. I know did a lot of work in putting this together. So thank you all. And without further ado, let me turn this over to Dr. Siegel. Joe. All right, as uh, Ambassador Bellamy has said, 2011 has been an extraordinary year of democratic change in Africa. <coughs> and while the events of the Arab Spring have taken most of the headlines, um, Sub-Saharan Africa has also seen some important advances over the past year. We've seen gains in long autocratic uh, um, Guinea, um, a reversal of a military coup in Niger. We've seen um, an upholding of election in Cote d'Ivoire that was uh, challenged for, for five months. We've seen uh, important strides forward in Nigeria and in Zambia, which in composite has elevated the democratic baseline in Africa. Um, from what we saw at the beginning of the year. And I should just make a footnote. When I say Africa, for the purposes of our discussion today and what we use in the report, I'm referring to Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, that you know doesn't mean that we don't recognize that much of the Arab Spring has been in North Africa. Um, but it is this uh, democratic progress that um, uh, we are trying to have a better understanding of in our conversation here today. Now, despite these gains, um, there remain some 40% of Africans' political systems that remain mostly organized along autocratic uh, principles. And so an important starting point for our analysis is that Africa's governance landscape uh, continues to be marked by great variance. We try to capture that in the report by classifying uh, all of Africa's uh, political systems into four main categories, which we draw on uh, using uh, the Polity 4 and Freedom House indices of governance. And so we have uh, a consolidating democracies category as sort of the most advanced uh, democratic uh, uh, institutions. We have a democratizing category. These are countries that are making uh, their way forward on a democratic path. We have a semi-authoritarian category, which are regimes that have adopted some practices of democracy, but in fact, real power continues to be vested in a single party, um, or in some cases with uh, single individuals. And then we have the remaining dozen or so autocrats on the continent where political space <coughs> remains highly uh, limited. And so when we talk about democratic progress for the purposes of this report, we're talking about relative progress. We're talking about progress that countries can make between these categories, not necessarily what it will take for all these countries to become consolidating democracies in the next several years. We also recognize at the outset that uh, democratic transitions globally and in Africa have been uh, characterized by high degrees of backsliding. In Africa, 65% of all democratizers um, have at one point or another experienced at least one episode of backsliding. This is slightly higher than the global average. Um, 
but equally importantly, two thirds of those countries that slide back um, ultimately resume a democratic trajectory within three years. And so this holds an important lesson that we aren't looking at a linear process necessarily, that more often than not it's a back and forth dynamic. And so as we observe the unfolding events in North Africa, and some people are distressed by what they see as a lost opportunity, it's important to keep in mind that this isn't necessarily atypical. And likewise, uh, uh, you know, there's an important lesson there for Africa's <coughs> consolidating democracies that uh, just because they've attained a certain threshold of democratic institution building, that doesn't mean that they have succeeded. That doesn't mean that the game is over. Indeed, they remain vulnerable to backsliding, and it's something that we're watching closely in a number of Africa's heretofore leading democracies like Senegal, Malawi, to some extent Benin, and, uh, and Botswana. So, in turning to the question of you know, what impact has the Africa Spring had on Africa's um, democratic trajectory, we start with the recognition that indeed the Arab Spring has captivated the attention of millions of Africans um, across all walks of life in all parts of the <laughs> continent. This has been a daily topic of discussion for much of the year. And this in turn has translated into some 15 different uh, protest movements that have um, arisen around the continent demanding greater political freedoms, uh, more accountability and transparency from their governments. Um, it has also uh, been a phenomenon that has been under close observation by Africa's autocrats who have been so threatened by what's happening in North Africa that uh, many have actually banned the term Arab Spring in their media and um, social networks and uh, have uh, tried to uh, prevent uh, any coverage uh, of, of the phenomena in general. Yet despite the deep resonance with which um, the Arab Spring has uh, been felt in Africa, our analysis has been that the direct linkages between the Arab Spring and Africa's democratic uh, gains has been relatively limited. Rather, there are more powerful, ongoing, parallel forces that have been underway in Sub-Saharan Africa that are explaining the advances that we have been seeing. And so when we talk about the effects of the Arab Spring on Africa, we have to think about it within this broader context, within this longer, um, broader process that is underway. At the same time, it would be wrong to conclude that the Arab Spring has been irrelevant for Africa's democratization process. As indicated, it has uh, captured the collective imagination of many Africans. This has raised levels of consciousness on the potential power of people organizing themselves and demanding change. It has raised awareness on uh, the uh, potential um, role and the important role of citizens in sustaining their mobilization to effect change in Africa, that democracy is not a one-time shot, it's a process of continued engagement. Um, it has also, and perhaps, perhaps most importantly, sparked a debate within Africa about the legitimate claims on authority uh, within the continent, and this way changing the, di the dynamic between citizens and the state. <coughs> So in this way, we see the Arab Spring as having many important indirect effects. It's a stimulant effect, if not a driver of change. But what do we mean by drivers? Well, by drivers, we're talking about some of the institutions, democratic <coughs> institutions of checks and balances and shared power. And in, on this front, we have seen very notable gains in Africa uh, over the last two decades, really, since the uh, return of multi-partyism in the 1990s, we have seen a steady 
incremental process of uh, institutional strengthening on mechanisms such as the uh, role of parliaments and independence of parliaments, uh, the autonomy and capacity of electoral management bodies, of the court system and local governments. And importantly, uh, I think for all of us who follow these things as practitioner, practitioners or scholars, it has really been in the second decade of Africa's democratization process that a lot of these institutions have gained traction. That shows you, to some extent, how long the institution building process takes takes to have impact. But we're really seeing um, an acceleration of this uh, institutional process in the 2000s rather than the 1990s. Now, this institution building process has been accompanied by an information revolution that has taken hold on the continent in the last five or six years. Today, some 50% of all adults have access to a cell phone in Africa. And this is dramatically changing the way uh, in which people communicate on the continent and the way that they can get information and the way that they can organize themselves. This is, um, this is coupled often with the growing emergence and strength sophistication of Africa's civil society, um, which um, historically has been at the forefront of uh, movements for democratic change in Africa and elsewhere. Um, often some of the leader, leading reformers uh, for change are youth. And Africa, as the youngest <coughs> continent, uh, is energized by its youth population, who being more educated than their parents in previous generations is more aware, it has more access to information about changes happening elsewhere in the world. And they're making greater demands on their governments than what has historically been the process, or than has historically been the case. Um, and finally, we note the growing uh, and, and elevating standards for democratic accountability and legitimacy being um, put forward by regional bodies, primarily the RECs, but also the African Union and international partners who are making and, and, and demanding uh, greater democratic accountability than has been the case in the past. So these drivers of democratic change are changing the governance equation in Africa and slowly chipping away at the uh, historical model of a monopolization of power in the executive branch uh, on the continent. And in fact, and, and closely related to this, is the, the observation really that Africa's remaining autocracies and semi-authoritarian governments are relatively weak compared to previous generations of autocrats on the continent. And by this, we mean that while they still retain potent course of capacity, um, they do not have the capacity to um, be resilient in the face of sustained domestic or international pressure. Certainly much less capacity than that exhibited uh, by the Tunisian government or the Egyptian government um, at the beginning of this year. Now, while there is this weakness among Africa's autocrats. We also have to recognize that there is weakness among Africa's democracies and democratizers. And uh, indeed, the democratic process remains incomplete in the majority of Africa's um, polities. And this is a prime reason why the Arab Spring resonates so deeply within Africa. And moreover, this, <clears throat> the process of democratic change in Africa faces a number of uh, uh, powerful countervailing forces that must be um, overcome if we are going to see the democratic trajectory continue to move upward. I'll just tick off a couple of these, which we discussed in greater length in the report. But first off is the um, continuing uh, attraction 
of neo-patrimonial governance models in Africa. Uh, even among some of Africa's democratizers and democracies, there's still a tendency to gravitate towards big man <coughs> governance styles. There's limited sense of national identity in many African countries that, uh, where people still tend to um, uh, organize along ethnic lines rather than towards a national um, uh, identity. Uh, in, in their orientation. There's the continued fragmentation of civil society, which in some countries remains um, mostly located in urban areas. Security sectors remain politicized and often focused more on regime security than on upholding the Constitution or protecting the population. More than 50% of all of Africa's autocrats are natural resource, primarily oil rich which provides them a revenue flow, allowing them to maintain a hold on power that they wouldn't have uh, absent the popular uh, support. 40% of Africa's democratizers are post-conflict <coughs> countries, and so they have to overcome the wounds and the social polarization, political polarization that these conflicts have endured. With China's growing influence on the continent, um, a number of Africa's autocrats also have a helping hand uh, through political and economic support. And most recently, with the demise of the Gaddafi regime in Libya, um, we have seen the uh, return of potentially thousands of armed mercenaries, armed and trained mercenaries, who uh, threaten to um, create more instability in a number of Sahelian countries that are trying to move towards democracy. And so Africa's governance landscape, as I said at the beginning, is highly varied. It's also highly dynamic. There are competing cross currents um, uh, on regimes at each classification level on the governance spectrum in Africa. And so in some ways we are seeing unfold a competition of governance norms on the continent. And it is in this context that the Arab Spring is weighing in and helping to shape that dynamic and help, helping to shape um, the direction uh, of Africa's democratic trajectory. And it is a conclusion of uh, this working group that um, the momentum of the institution building processes that I had referred to, the democratic checks and balances, is strong enough that in fact we expect to see further advances in democratic gains in the next couple of years um, uh, as we move forward. That's not to say there won't be some further backsliding, but we anticipate that the net gain in uh, democratic um, uh, levels will be positive here in the coming years. So with that, let me stop and turn over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Chris Molina. Thank you very much, uh, Joe and uh, Ambassador Bellamy, uh, for your leadership here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies and Joe especially for uh, having the foresightedness to um, convene this working group and, and to lead it uh, so e effectively. Uh, I think the report is it's a real synopsis or a snapshot in time uh, on the state of democratization in Africa. And uh, Joe has done a wonderful job giving you all an overview of what is contained in the report. Um, one of the advantages of having a pre-distributed pre report is that uh, every one of you is uh, supposed to have read the report page and line. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, we can um, go through a, brief, uh, a few brief ob observations and then open it up for more interactive sessions uh, with, with questions and answers. Um, there are a few issues that we try to capture in the report that I would like to highlight for the purposes of uh, this uh, discussion. 
The first one is that um, when in looking at the Arab Spring, I think we came to the conclusion that there were a number of common threats um, in the countries that had experienced the Arab Spring, uh, and three of them really stood out. Uh, the first one is the uh, longevity of uh, the regimes in question in terms of their exercise of political power. Uh, the second common thread was the uh, perverse sense of meaningless elections, uh, or no elections at all in the case of Libya, um, through constant manipulation of choice options that were provided to citizens. And the third common thread was the shrinking political space in those countries, uh, with an ultimate determination on the part of incumbent regimes to enforce a patrilineal succession at the helm of the state. Uh, regrettably, uh, these three elements are still prevalent in a number of countries uh, on the continent of Africa. Uh, I could cite uh, Equatorial Guinea, Angola, Uganda, and even to some extent Senegal, the whole debate that's uh, around uh, the political uh, environment in Senegal at this point uh, centers around this issue of succession. The second point that we also try to capture in the, uh, in the report is the fact that uh, previous autocratic models of Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya are no longer currency, and therefore surviving autocrats on the continent no longer have a, a frame of reference. Uh, some of you may be very familiar with the old debate about uh, development versus democracy that was floated in the 60s by developmental theorists. Uh, you also would be very familiar with the debate that is raised in the last uh, two decades about the universality versus exceptionalism of democracy as a value system. And that across Africa, in a number of countries, uh, regimes were very eager uh, to talk about the accomplishments of Ben Ali in terms of development in Tunisia or the accomplishments of Mubarak and, and Gaddafi, uh, and using that as excuses to limit further political, uh, to limit further political space in their respective countries on the pretext that as long as a regime could construct some roads and schools and public buildings, then the citizens would be willing to give it a blank check irrespective of the low respect for their basic human rights and political aspirations. As a result of what has happened in Northern Africa, um, the debate about regime longevity of service, uh, which used to be a taboo subject in, in most of Africa just two decades ago, um, has now become a commonplace debate. And it's been aided in that in some measure uh, by the progress of the last two decades. Uh, for example, in the late 80s and as recently as 1990, um, only three former African heads of state had relinquished power and were living freely on the continent. Uh, that was uh, Nyerere, Julius Nyerere of Tanzania, uh, Senghor of Senegal, and Ahijo of Cameroon. And today, over 50 Africans have served in state house, and more than 25 of that number uh, have actively contributed to meaningful transitions in their respective countries. Uh, today, in West Africa, um, in the sub-region that is always referred to as ECOWAS, in the, within the communi economic community of West African states, for example, except for three presidents, uh, the president of Burkina Faso, the Gambia, and Senegal, all of the other serving heads of states, 13 of the, in 13 of the 16 countries, have been in office for less than 10 years. And many of them are term limited. So there is a trend that is moving in the right direction that we have seen in the last two decades on the African continent. The third uh, point that we try to highlight in the report is that the trajectory of expectations and demands for democracy and good, good governance 
continue to rise across Africa, despite the staying power of incumbency and authoritarianism. Uh, this has been demonstrated by various studies, um, including the work that uh, Joel and a number of others have done with the Afrobarometer studies, that show that even in the countries that are democratizing, uh, that while many Africans would express dissatisfaction with the level of delivery of services or the performance of their governments, they continue to aspire to democratic governance. Increasingly, we're having a lot more debate on the, on the premise that legality alone no longer suffices and that legitimacy is also an important criteria in being able to um, get into office and to hold on to public office. Increasingly, the vibrancy of civil society and sense of self-empowerment of other democratic actors in legislatures and judiciary bodies uh, all contribute to that. And I know that Ned will uh, come back to this issue in his uh, observations as well. These democratic proponents across the continent are aided in that regard by new technology uh, and the silent communications revolution, but also by uh, two new concepts, which I think we have to factor into our analysis of political developments on the African continent. One is the concept and the international norm on the responsibility to protect, which was adopted by the United Nations in 2005, and which increasingly is finding its way into the domestic debate in a lot of African countries. And the second one is the aspirations that Africans have, had to, have come to have of the institutions that govern regional and continental bodies such as the African Union, and I'm referring specifically to the Charter on <coughs> Democracy, Elections, and Governance, as well as the regional bodies such as SADC and ECOWAS. My fourth point would probably um, go in the opposite direction in acknowledging that despite this rosy prospect, uh, the report also does acknowledge what we all know, which is that all habits die hard. Uh, we must therefore brace ourselves to the fact that of meaning a remaining autocrat will not move without a fight. Uh, in this regard, the report also touches on the fact that unlike some of the sub-regional organizations, uh, such as ECOWAS, and probably to a lesser extent, SADC, the African Union is first placing its own credibility on the line. We all celebrated the African Union's Constitutive Act in 2002. Uh, we cheered for the African Union's Charter on Democracy, Elections, and Governance uh, that was adopted at the General Assembly in 2007, even if not enough members have ratified it thus far. But I am embarrassed today when I read editorials about how the Arab League has become such a progressive organization compared to the African Union. And sadly though, that criticism, in my view, is warranted. The AU has been behind the curve with regards to siding with pro-democracy and pro-reform elements during the most trying moments of the Arab Spring. That has created a lot of doubt amongst African Democrats as to how the organization, as to the stance that the organization could take with regards to further developments in some of the remaining autocratic, with regards to some of the remaining autocratic regimes on the continent. I believe that the AU must retain or regain its credibility at the risk of being sidelined, as was the case with its predecessor organization, the Organization of African Unity. Uh, let me conclude with an anecdote um, that many of you may relate to. Uh, for those of you who may have worked on the elections in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 2006, uh, those were very challenging elections, uh, but the Congo managed to pull them through, in large part because of the determination of the Congolese people, uh, as well as with the support, because of the support that was given to them by the international community. 
the chairman of the election commission in Congo uh, was a very respected gentleman, uh, Malu Malu, uh, who later on in 2000, April of 2007, came to Nigeria to monitor the Nigerian elections as part of an international delegation with our sister organization, the International Republican Institute. And Malu Malu was deployed to Kaduna, and he went from Abuja, the capital city, to Kaduna by road. And when he came back from his deployment side, all he talked about was how much infrastructure Nigeria had. He said, my goodness, they have roads. They have tarred roads. But why can't they organize an election? <laughs> that was his question. And so in August of 2007, a few months after the April elections in Nigeria, uh, Sierra Leone had its elections. And NDI, the organization that I work for, fielded an international delegation, and we asked the Senate President of Nigeria, uh, Senator Ken Nemani, to be one of our co-leaders. And so he came to Sierra Leone with us. And the, on the morning of election day, around 5.30 a.m., 6 o'clock, as we tried to get to the polling sites before the opening of the polls, he dashed into one of the polling stations, he looked around, he ran out very quickly, and he called me, he said, Chris, they've got ballot boxes. We didn't even have ballot boxes in Nigeria. Here, and for him, that was a huge development. That was a huge improvement. And then, fortunately, in 2011, Nigeria had its act together. They changed the election commission. They brought in a more credible chairman of the election commission. They worked extremely hard because they wanted to earn the credibility of Nigerians first, but also to show the, the rest of the world that they could do it right. And they had very good elections in April of 2011. And NDI invited a number of Egyptians, uh, some of the civic leaders who led the movement in Tahrir Square, to come to Nigeria and witness the Nigerian electoral process. Nine of them made the trip. And as we debriefed with them just before they left Abuja, we asked them the one thing that really stood out for them. To a person who said, oh my goodness, they actually count ballots here. <laughs> they didn't know. And they said, for the first time, they saw people actually counting ballots at the polling site and recording those elections as had been um, registered by, by, as had been you know, uh, voted for by the voters on election day. And for them, that was a novelty in a country that we'd been told had been having elections for 30 years of Mubarak's rule. Uh, the offshoot of this set of anecdotes for me is to say that the continent aspires to be governed differently, that Africa has what it takes to put in place democratic processes and democratic systems um, and democratic institutions. Uh, the unfortunate story is that we still have a, a couple of autocrats sitting in the way, and except we collectively work really hard in the next few years, we could see some reversals of, on the gains that have been made in the last two decades. And with that, I will ask uh, my colleague Ned to summarize with the recommendations of the working group. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. And uh, I would too would like to add my voice to, uh, to uh, recognizing the, the central role that, that Joe Siegel played in, in producing this report and uh, uh, making it, uh, I think, uh, a, uh, a, a very useful piece of work and, and one that will hopefully will have legs and uh, will um, be able to, uh, to have some resonance uh, with the recommendations. Um, so that's what I'm going to focus on very briefly here because I, I know that we, we want to get to a discussion uh, period. Um, but let me just begin with a contextual thought, and that is that um, I, I have in mind sort of five different contexts for democratic transitions. Or, uh, and three of them are, are the traditional ones that Huntington outlined uh, over two decades ago, where democratic change can happen through, um, through a replacement of an existing regime, a uh, transformation, a change from within, and, uh, and a transplacement or a negotiated change. Uh, and, and I think we've seen examples of these three types of, of, of changes occurring uh, on, on the continent over time. But I think we need to add a couple of other contextual um, examples uh, at this point in time when we're looking at the question of the extent of democratic governance in Africa currently. 
Um, one of those is going to be, um, you know, the existence of um, uh, democratic systems on the continent that are functioning, um, and the challenge there is is the challenge of, of, of rollback that both Joe and, and Chris have mentioned. Um, I think we can take some uh, solace from the fact that this rollback does not uh, always be permanent in nature, as, as Joe emphasized, but uh, it, it is something that we need to be very concerned about, the qualitative functioning of democracy. Uh, not only in Africa, of course, we've seen in Latin America as well challenges in the, in the qualitative functioning of democracy in countries such as Venezuela with a uh, lack of trust in, in some of the intermediary institutions of democracy. But we are in a situation now in, in Africa where there are a number of states that, that meet uh, basic criteria for democracy, and so I think we all uh, want to be focused and concerned about how to deepen that democracy and, and to further uh, to help uh, promote its existence and, and consolidation. Uh, the other context, of course, is the semi-authoritarian context. Um, what, what used to be called, I'm old enough to remember the term illiberal democracy, uh, and I, I, I think it's still got some validity, but we can, we can call it semi-authoritarianism, where autocrats um, have figured out how to use the language of democracy and some of the institutional forms of democracy without really um, main, uh, allowing or permitting a spirit of alternance in power or the, the, the spirit of the functioning of democracy to, to, to play fully. So we have to be very, I think, aware of that particular situation because it pertains in a number of countries uh, on the continent today. So it, it's in the, those kinds of preliminary thoughts about different contexts that uh, these uh, recommendations have been have been developed and, and, and crafted. And uh, you know, I'd like to think that that these recommendations are are, are valid sort of across these different different sort of models of, of democratic context and democratic transitions. Although obviously recommendations are gonna, you know, for some countries, some recommendations I think will have more direct relevance than, than others. Um, I'm gonna briefly give you the, the headings of the different sets of recommendations and then go into a, very quickly a little bit more detail. Um, we're looking at five different general sets of recommendations. One uh, relates to the the international context, uh, the regional and international actors, and what they can be doing to, uh, to further promote democracy. Second set of recommendations has to do with the functioning of the uh, uh, systems of governance in African countries. Third set of recommendations have to do with uh, the role of civil society. A fourth set have to do with the all-important uh, area of media, uh, technology information dissemination, which I think we all recognize has become vital and probably may, if we were doing this 10 years ago, may not have had such a, uh, such a prominent place, but I, I think it's well uh, warranted now. And of course, the, 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 the fifth area has to do with civil military relations and the role of, of uh, uh, the security sector in, 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 in promoting uh, democratic governance and playing its role in democratic governance. So, um, so very quickly and, and not comprehensively here, let me just touch on some of the, some of the recommendations. In the first set, uh, related to the international community and, and, and regional actors, I think there's, there's three recommendations that kind of fit within this uh, international norm kind of uh, approach to promoting democracy, which has become much, uh, much more important in, uh, in, in the past uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, so there, we're, we're, we've already, you've already heard my colleagues talk about the importance of, um, of the RECs, of the regional groupings, the sub-regional groupings, uh, and uh, uh, how they can uh, inculcate democratic values uh, in their activities and focus. Um, and this is true not just for Africa. You know, I was thinking about uh, regional organizations like SARC in South Asia and the Andean Pact in, uh, in, in Latin America that, uh, that have been interested in these types of issues as well. <clears throat> so it's really sort of this is recommendation is, 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 is to these regional commissions and to the international community to support them in creative ways that they can 
serve as what the French call the plaque tournant, the, the intermediary between universal values and the realities on the ground. And, and these regional groups, I think, have that special credibility of being close to the ground, but also reflecting broader uh, international values. Uh, I don't know that I need to emphasize much more what's been said already about the African Union, about a sense of real disappointment um, that the African Union has not been able to more effectively uh, develop a, a robust capacity for promoting democratic governance on the continent, uh, especially when one looks at the fact that there have been more and more democratic nations that, uh, that constitute uh, you know, the African Union uh, itself. And I, I know that it's, 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 these things are, are, are very complicated, but um, I, um, it is interesting, uh, having written, co-authored a book on the issue of regional organizations and democracy five years ago, where we placed the African Union higher than the Arab League, uh, and, and now when we look at Syria and what's going on, we, we, uh, we definitely raise some questions about that. So I think there's some well-warranted constructive criticism that can be made, and hopefully the encouragement uh, can be developed so that the AU could play its role amongst the ranks of other regional organizations such as the European Union and the, the OAS with its democratic charter uh, in, in, in really taking a lead on this. Uh, then the, uh, I think a very important, uh, not only for symbolic uh, uh, recommendation, is the ratification of the African Charter on Democracy, Elections, and Good, good Governance. Uh, we're, we're getting close to it. I, I think there's close to a dozen countries that have ratified it, ratified it now. Um, so hopefully that will that will the 15 uh, will be uh, that the threshold will be reached for it to go into uh, into force. Um, other recommendations that are directed at the international community perhaps relate to uh, further refinement and coordination of development policies and security assistance policies with democratic reform. Um, so that the, the, the signal can be sent that, uh, of the priority place that issues related to democratic reform play in assuring medium and long-term stability in countries uh, and trying to avoid this, this sort of myopic short-term stability view. Uh, and I think that there are countries like Ethiopia and, 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 and other countries where um, the, these issues are quite relevant. Um, <clears throat> further... Um, uh, actions that would isolate regimes that use force against peaceful protesters. Uh, the toolbox there can be expanded. Incentives for positive leadership. Uh, uh, you know, we all are familiar with, with Mo Ibrahim's approach, um, but there's a whole range, I think, of pos incentives for positive leadership that can be, can be further developed. And then, and then there's, there's the, the last two for the international community really relate to the, the question about uh, about, um, you know, in the development world, we talk about enabling environments. So I'm thinking of the enabling environment for democratic transitions to, uh, so that the international community can be more prepared uh, for, internet, for a democratic, to be supportive of democratic tr transitions, especially in the early days, perhaps, when, uh, uh, when um, uh, uh, a considerable amount of support is, is needed. Uh, and it also means, uh, I think, for greater uh, thought being put into the issue about how to ease authoritarian leaders out of power um, to, uh, to encourage the Qaddafis of the world, perhaps, to, uh, to uh, take, a, uh, take another path. Um, so there's, there's work that could be done there. The second set of recommendations has to do with, with, African, with the governance systems in Africa. First three have to do with elections. Uh, clearly, there needs to be continued focus and improvements on the administration of elections. <clears throat> and so we're talking there about um, promoting the, uh, the, uh, the independence of election authorities, uh, the capacity uh, uh, of election authorities, uh, and security uh, in and around elections. And there have been a lot of, I think, a lot of experimentation that's been done over the past 10, 15 years in this regard. Uh, in terms of, for example, creating security forces specifically for elections that uh, may not have the same taint as security forces that have been associated with authoritarian leadership. Um, so there's a lot that can be done there. Uh, then other institutional related issues have to do with the question of term limits. 
uh, we've seen a, a bit of a, uh, of a uh, uh, maneuvering around term limits on the part of some uh, uh, long-term serving uh, African presidents, uh, particularly presidential term limits we're talking about here. Uh, and this is something that needs to be, uh, I think, uh, given a tremendous amount of focus and a tremendous amount of, shall we say, encouragement, uh, if not... Uh, not more strong actions uh, taken to, to, to reflect the idea here that in certain contexts, it's, 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 it, the cause of democratic institutions is not deepened, is not promoted when you have uh, extension of, of, of leadership uh, for uh, indefinite periods of time. Uh, the question about elections with majority, uh, presidential elections that, uh, that re require majority, seems to make a lot of sense in an African context where we're looking to promote consensual uh, agreement uh, and legitimacy around candidates. Uh, and these, are, these are issues that um, people say, well, they don't, you, know, you don't worry about that in the United States. Uh, you know, why, why are you holding Africa to a different standard? Well, I think that, that uh, you know, the genius of democracy is that, uh, is that it's flexible and that it needs to relate to the contextual realities of the situations in which in which uh, different different countries find themselves, and so uh, given uh, given uh, some of the very deep divisions and uh, cleavages that we find within many uh, societies, African societies, this seems to be an idea that carries a lot of weight to it. Uh, other ideas relate to the importance of strengthening oversight, led, and particularly legislatures. Um, I would refer you all to, to Joel uh, Barkin and, and the work that he and colleagues have done on, on African legislatures there, but uh, clearly um, I think a lot more uh, work can be done to institutionalize um, a, uh, 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 systems in which mistakes can be avoided because oversight can be effectively um, uh, undertaken. Democratic functioning of political parties is one that it also has caught our attention. Um, there's an argument out there about whether parties have to be democratic internally to be democratic uh, more broadly. Um, I would simply say that, uh, that the ability of parties, political parties, to absorb information from the grassroots up and to be able to, to have a, a, an internal dialogue uh, tends to strengthen their ability to develop platforms um, and to develop policy alternatives and to to be able to to, to, to play a role of presenting alternatives that's that's so critical in a, in a pluralistic democratic society. Um, finally, the last point, yep, the last point uh, in that section would be this question about about um, finding creative ways to promote institutional reform that, that minimizes losers in, in the democratic game while maintaining uh, the, the fundamental essence of a democratic system where, where there, are, there are going to be winners and losers, but there's ways to attenuate this, either through uh, senates, <clears throat> through proportional representation in election, uh, legislative election systems, at least to some extent, uh, in decentralization, uh, in uh, dis distributing power around within the, the institutional systems. And we all know that democracies, that, that, that uh, adjustments occur to, to strengthen democracies over time. So I think there's a lot of work that can be done there. I'm not going to say a lot about civil society. I think that uh, the argument here is that it has played a critical role in promoting democracy um, not only in Africa, but, uh, but in, in, in most regions around the world, and that continued emphasis needs to be placed on improving the role that civil society can play here. And we're looking particularly at improving coordination between civil society groups and promoting uh, activities that can strengthen a sense of national identity uh, that civil society is well uh, equipped to, to, to undertake. Uh, then moving on to this media section, which I think is a very interesting section. Uh, some of the ideas that we're, 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 we're tossing out relate to um, improving uh, media and technology uh, business practices. And uh, here, one idea, I think, has to relate to uh, public opinion and, and, and being able to, uh, to promote and, and identify and articulate public opinion uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a more sort of comprehensive kind of way, which can help nourish a democratic debate, can help inform uh, and give some kind of empirical sense to what are the policy issues that are out there. 
uh, and, and the media uh, certainly can, can play that. And uh, research, you know, on social uh, media uh, is a very new field, but it's one that's happening in Africa as well, and, and one that I think should be, uh, should be promoted. Diverse and independent media ownership, having a variety of, of ownership in the media, I think is, is important. Uh, I think maybe our Italian friends could, could say something about yeah. that. Um, um, to avoid having uh, media ownership that is it's either uh, limited and, 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 and even worse, limited and, and solely close to power. Um, strengthening media and, and, and technology professional organizations to, to further professionalize the, the, the media. Ensuring protection of the media from uh, physical uh, and, and other types of, of repression. Uh, s allowing uh, the grassroots to have a voice to the further development of community radio, uh, another idea. And then, and then the idea that, that the media should be encouraged to actively uh, further develop self-regulation um, because it's their job to do that and because um, uh, it's always becomes you know, a very controversial issue about this question of state relationship to media. Even in established democracies, we know that, that this is a, a very complicated issue, and the more that there's, there's credible uh, um, sense of professionalism and, and, and uh, uh, self-awareness on the part of the media, uh, the more the problems can be attenuated in that regard. And finally, the last area that, uh, that we're suggesting that there be a focus on is, is the area of uh, security sector support for, for democratic governance. And the, the first idea here, I think, is one that, that we are all quite familiar with, and that is, uh, that is professionalizing the, the, the military in, uh, and the role of a democratic governance, the role of the military in a democratic governance, but also educating civilian leadership on the role of the military in, in, in democratic leadership, so that you can have more of a common language that's being spoken there, uh, and and uh, integration and, and a support of military for uh, for democratic institutions, democratic processes. Another idea that we have is um, is the idea, perhaps, of, of developing some type of comparative methodologies, some sort of peer uh, review uh, function uh, for uh, security sectors um, to be able to share ideas and practices about uh, about the role of the military in in, uh, in democratic governance, and and to sort of look at how militaries are doing in this regard. Uh, peer reviews are, are becoming, I think, increasingly a part of the democracy and good governance equation, uh, ranging from the OECD's uh, peer review mechanism to the um, <clears throat> to the uh, to the UN Human Rights Council's Universal Periodic Review. Uh, certainly in Africa, we're familiar with the uh, the APRM, which itself, I think, could be strengthened and further developed. But uh, it's probably something that can be done in the security sector in that regard as well. Uh, and uh, finally, we're, we're urging um, that, um, that, that militaries reflect the heterogeneity that exists within many African societies, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, another obvious, uh, I think, recommendation would be a close look being taken at, at, uh, uh, at, at presidential security uh, and, and, and uh, security of senior government officials and, and how uh, that can be done uh, to ensure security, but to avoid that these uh, types of security um, units uh, uh, avoid them playing a disproportionate role and in in, in influencing in a negative way the political life of, uh, of, of many, uh, many African countries. So I think that there's a lot on the table. I have, I'm sure that um, there's, there's a lot out there to discuss, and um, so I will, I'll leave that.